why can't the U.S. compete? Well, Stephen Denning, he is former program director of knowledge management at the World Bank, is here to help us understand that. He's also author of this book you see here, The Leader's Guide to Radical Management, Reinventing the Workplace for the 21st Century. And we're so happy to have you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. So just taking a look at that example of these solar plants, mm -hmm. uh, and even Obama back in 2010, he pointed out 15 years ago, the U.S. was manufacturing 40% of the world's solar panels, and fast forward to 2008, it was 5%. Why can't the U.S. get this manufacturing back and compete with China? Once it's gone, it's hard to get it back. And whole sectors of the economy have just gone. And so the expertise isn't here anymore. So when Amazon wanted to build a Kindle, make a Kindle, they had no choice but to go to Asia. There was no expertise in this country to make it happen. So the pieces come from China, from Taiwan, from Korea. It simply isn't possible. So you have whole sectors which have gone. You have sectors which are at risk and a few sectors which are still here. So that picture is one of the reasons why I think we're not looking at just a cyclical phenomenon but a phase transition. Well, and this is something that you have written about and you wrote it in a very popular Forbes article that's gotten more than 250,000 page views. So it obviously really resonated with people. Why do you think it resonated so much with people? The sort was true. <laughs> 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 from their own experience, I mean. But do you think it's something that nobody is really talking about from that perspective? And they also saw that, understood why it was happening. That the example that I gave of Dell, uh, which uh, was making uh, uh, computers, and one of their suppliers came to them and said, uh, "Look, we're making this little circuit board. We're doing it pretty well. Why don't we take over the motherboard? Because that's not your core expertise, and if you." Uh, hand it over to us, then you'd be able to let go of all those people and we'll make it. You'll make a lot more money. And so it's better off. And they did that and they made more money and their profits went up. And then the company came back and said, well, why don't we do that with the whole computer? Why don't we do that with assembling the computer? Why don't we do that with the supply chain and successive steps? Dell's profits were going up and up. But the final time they came back, it was not to talk to Dell. It was to talk to Best Buy to talk to the other retailers and say, look, we have a computer which is better than Dell's and 20% cheaper. So bingo. One company is gone. Uh, and when whole arrays of companies do the same thing, you have whole industries basically disappearing. And so it sounds like you're saying these solar companies, that's just part of a much larger trend that speaks to where manufacturing has gone over the last decades. But what do you really attribute that to as far as the reasons why it all started to go overseas. The underlying force is that mm -hmm. these companies have been pursuing short-term profits. They've been seeing that as the goal of the company to make money for their shareholders. And when you have that as a goal, it makes sense to destroy the company. Uh, you, you start doing things that don't uh, make sense for long term. So there's a whole movement underway to manage organizations differently and to focus not on making money for their shareholders, but on delighting customers through continuous innovation. And when you adopt that goal, it doesn't make sense to ship in a, a expertise overseas because you're going to need that in future to delight the customers. But aren't people pretty much taught that that is the business model in business school and that that is the model of business that is uh, then instituted and believed in at every level from policy to corporations to management consultants to CEOs? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> what do you I mean? mean? You, you read the business books, uh, attend the business uh, school classes, uh, listen to pretty much uh, every CEO. When you parse carefully what they're saying, the bottom line is making profits for the shareholders for most firms. And so this uh, is written about by Roger Martin in a wonderful article, The Age of Customer Capitalism, that we are, in fact, passing from that age where organizations focus on making money to the shareholders to a new age where they focus totally on delighting the customer. So organizations like Apple, like Amazon, like Salesforce do that and you find when you do that you actually make more money than if you're focused on making money. Yeah, but come on. We just saw a report that came out that CEOs, 20 of the 25 of the biggest U.S. companies, the CEOs made a lot more than the company paid in corporate tax. It doesn't really seem like we're seeing a huge shift from this paradigm of businesses where profits are the bottom line, CEOs are paid lavishly, and it doesn't matter at what cost that comes. 
what you're not looking at in a sense is the longer term trends. If you look at a um, uh, wonderful study, the shift index uh, done by Deloitte uh, looks at the rate of return on assets for firms over the last 40 years, they've declined by 75%. The, the life expectancy of a firm in the Fortune 500 used to be 75 years, it's now less than 15 years and they're heading fast towards five years. This, what we see in the outsourcing of jobs and the loss of competitors there is reflected in the, the statistics about the life expectancies of firms. So they're making profits like Dell. Dell was making tons of money, uh, but then suddenly realized there was nothing left, and that's what's happening in the organization. So some of the famous organizations, uh, the stalwarts like Walmart and General Electric, oh, look at their share price over the last 10 years, uh, basically either static or in GE's case uh, gone down significantly. The, the stock market has realized there's a huge difference between companies that can innovate continuously like Amazon, like Apple, uh, like Salesforce and companies that are basically just trading water and continuing with trying to make money for their shareholders. So this the whole revolution in the way organizations are managed. You can't wouldn't say that large numbers of the Fortune 500 have yet grasped this, but the, the trends are there. And if you look carefully at the implications of it, uh, it's inexorable. But if you look really carefully, you're citing a few companies, but more big picture, is this something that is really at all representative of corporations in the United States? The Lloyd study uh, looked at 20,000 U.S. firms over, over 40 years. Hugely comprehensive, every sector. Uh, the trend is widespread. Uh, a few companies, are sli a few sectors are slightly better, a few are slightly worse, but the overall picture is, is uh, it, it, it's, it's pervasive. It's pervasive that mm -hmm. people are starting to manage longer term and not for short term profits? That the companies being managed in the way that they are are dying faster than ever. So you're so, saying that a company either has to adopt what you're talking about or else they're going to go out of business right. because they're right. not going to be able to compete exactly. because they're just going to be competing exactly. with these other countries that can do it better. Exactly. It's, it's delight or die. Unless, you, unless you're able to innovate and keep innovating and delighting your customers, you're going to go out of business.